Well, good morning, Northland family. How y'all doing? Glad to hear it. Thank you so much for bringing the church into these rooms. We're gathered here this morning, as we do every week, to worship God for who he is, what he's done, and what he continues to do. Here at Northland, our mission statement is engaging people to be fully alive in Jesus. And nowhere is that more prevalent than in the way that we serve one another. And I'd just like to take a second to show some appreciation for all of the volunteers and the staff that showed up over this past week for the Christmas Eve services. Would y'all give them a big round of applause? We serve... <laughs> We served thousands of people over this past week and uh, showed them the love of Christ, and it's a big, big deal. I want to take a second to welcome the people worshiping with us online, the people in the uh, correctional institutions, and in the interest of making sure that everybody feels welcome here, would you please stand up, turn to the person next to you, and say hello. All right, if you're feeling sufficiently welcome, would you stay on your feet? And let's continue to work.
forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty. Meditate on these words of scripture. Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 to 7, 14. 
but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that this life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is a work in us, but life is a work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Matthew 8, 23 through 27 says this, Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we raise a hallelujah. We raise many hallelujahs to you this morning, this final weekend of worship of 2019. Some of us are standing here and ready to just shut that door really hard to 2019. Some of us had uh, landmark events happen this year, and it was a, um, a memorable year for great reasons. But whatever we're stepping into, we are ready for what you have for us in 2020. We are ready for your timing that is always perfect. We know you are sovereign. We know you will take care of us, and you're going to lead us where we should be. One of my favorite lines from that song that we just sung was, heaven comes to fight for me. Please remind us as we move forward that you are always with us, that we are not alone and that we're stepping into whatever is coming. You are with us all the time. You have come to fight for us and you always will. And we thank you for this. We are grateful. In your name we pray, amen. Well, you can have a seat. I'm so excited that I get to be with you on the last weekend of 2019. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that we only have a couple more days uh, in this year. I was actually taking my daughter on Friday morning early at 6.30. Uh, There was 150 high school students that left the Northland property, three big buses, headed up to Sharp Top, up to Jasper, Georgia. Be praying for them. I've been hearing updates. Uh, They're having an amazing time at Christmas camp, something that's been happening here for over 20 25 years. As we were driving, we hit Starbucks on the way and we got to talking about how we're about to start a new decade, 2020. And I started sharing with her um, sort of a piece of history that she wasn't very familiar with, Y2K. Um, How many of you remember the hysteria around Y2K for those that tried to, you know, you've tried to block that memory out. Y2K was that, that apocalyptic type of evening where we were sure the bank systems were going to shut down, the s- stock market was going to crash, you weren't going to be able to get gas. I knew families that moved from Orlando, sold everything, went out west. People were terrified that everything was going to come undone at the stroke of midnight, 1999. Nothing happened. Uh, my daughter was so confused, like, why do people do that? We, I don't know, why do people do that? But here we are coming into the end of this year, and it's always an interesting time to look backwards and think about what God has been doing and also think about what's happening here coming in 2020. And as we are kind of wrapping up and finishing this year, I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the last two months of this year for our family. It's been an especially exciting time because we are big Star Wars fans. And we have just loved, um, I grew up on Star Wars. It's so cool that my kids are more obsessed with it than I am. We went and saw The Rise of Skywalker, the last of the trilogy of of the Skywalker uh, saga. Just amazing stuff. But put that aside, there's something bigger that's been going on with Star Wars. Maybe um, you're familiar with this. Um, if, you, if you haven't, uh, there's a character that has actually um, been hitting the scenes. Everybody's been so excited about this character. His name is Baby Yoda. Have you seen this guy? Baby Yoda has hit uh, the pop culture um, in an amazing, amazing way. In fact, what's so curious about this character is um, nobody knew he was coming. Uh, uh, Disney and Star Wars partnered together. They created this, uh, this TV series. They did it old school, like one episode a week. You'd have to wait for every Thursday or Friday for the new episode to come out. And at the very first episode, it was all building up to the, the crescendo, this ending, this big reveal of what was in this little pod, like this little carriage looking thing. And all of a sudden it opens up. And there's baby Yoda. My kids were cheering. My wife might have cried. It might have been me that was crying. Um, And instantly, we did what a lot of people started to do. We were like, we need baby Yoda for Christmas. And so we were Googling Amazon, trying to find, like, how do we get, you know, some Baby Yoda plushes? Um, Maybe you did this yourself. You did a Google search. No worries. This item will be released on May 25th, 2020. 
We're like, this has to be a mistake. Somebody out there is, is producing these things, right? Well, come to find out, the writers of this show and the producers and Disney, they all got together and decided they wanted no spoiler, no, no spoiling of this character. And so they estimate that something like $2.7 million was lost by not having Baby Yoda ready for Christmas. As you know, these things kind of, people are always scouring the internet. They're looking for patents that are registered and that's how they anticipate technology and toys. And there was nothing out there on Baby Yoda because Disney, Star Wars, they wanted so much for this to be a surprise. Timing was everything for them. And so if you really want one of these, you're gonna have to wait. I was thinking about timing though as it relates to some other toys, you know, coming off the Christmas season. Maybe some of you remember back in the 80s. I was born in 1973 and so I'm kind of an 80s child. You might remember some of you uh, parents, grandparents, some of the craze around the timing of different toys. Maybe you remember back in the early 80s, 1983 Cabbage Patch Dolls. I mean... Those things are ugly, I'm sorry. Like even then, I could not figure out what is wrong with these things. But for those of you that are younger, pre-internet, like you couldn't just order these things online. You had to go store to store, Toys R Us, Walmart, Sears. You would get there, you know, you'd be in line, the doors would open, and what would you see? Empty shelves, nothing there. Maybe for the boys, 1984 Transformers were a big deal. 88 Nintendo, I grew up on uh, Atari, you know, it was all space invaders for me, but 88 Nintendo hit the scene. Maybe you remember in the mid 90s, Beanie Babies, right? I had a, a roommate in college, big football player. He collected these things. He would, he would set up a little table and a chair and sit out in, um, in the corner of, of his neighborhood and he would have these things all out and he'd be bartering and trading and, and man, there'd be lines of people and some of those things were worth thousands of dollars. I don't even know if you can give them away now, but somehow they were the hot ticket around the mid-90s. Again, or 1997, these Tamagotchis, Tamaguchis, I don't even know how you say it. Um, some egg-like toy, do you guys remember this? Some of the kids maybe, it had um, a digital pet that you had to feed throughout the day. It would get sick and you had to give it medicine. I'm like, man, why, why do I wanna add that to my life? Um, whether it's toys or it's the stock market or here we are going into an election year with politics, the topic of timing is such a big deal. And we're gonna enter into a story today where Jesus talks a lot about the significance of timing through the lens of the creator versus the way we often look at timing. If you're new here, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Maybe it's first time in a long time. Um, We're going through a series right now called Awaken. And in this series, we're looking at the Gospel of John, one of the four Gospel writers, and we're unpacking these stories. We're walking in the footsteps of Jesus, looking at the ways that he interacted with people, the miracles, the way that it was a significant time period in in who he was and what he said, not just for the first century, but what does it mean for us today in the 21st century? How is that impacting us, not just for eternity? What does that mean for today? And I love what the gospel uh, writer John writes at the very end of of, uh, John chapter one. He says this, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. I love that, so poetic, so beautiful. We're gonna look at one of those stories though this morning and we're gonna go through and unpack what that means. So if you have your scriptures, turn to John chapter seven. Uh, In your worship guide, there's a few verses there that you can look at. I'm actually gonna cover a lot of this chapter. I'm gonna read it straight through. Um, Not the whole chapter, but a significant portion of it. I'm not gonna give a lot of commentary until afterwards. I just wanna let the story breathe. Let the Bible speak. Just hear the details of what's happening here and begin to wrap your mind already around this topic of timing and what Jesus has to say. Let's go to uh, John chapter seven, verse one. Sorry, Faye, you're gonna have to flip it, my my, uh, remote. Oh, here we go. 
Yeah, let's go. First one. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore, Jesus told them, my time is not yet here for you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. And after he said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. And now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were there amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is, who's trying to kill you? And Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all amazed. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to move through this text. There's so much here, so much to unpack. We're not going to try to get into all of it. We'll continue into chapter seven next week, but I want to cover four areas that will help us um, unpack some of this. But first, let's get a summary. You know, just review quickly what was happening. Jesus is in Galilee with his brothers. Some of you may not even be aware that Jesus had siblings. Imagine being a brother of Jesus. Always is going to have the right answers, valid Victorian, straight A's, right? Um, If there's a choice that's going to be made, Jesus is always going to make the right choice. Um, And of course, he was going to be favored by Mary and Joseph differently than the other siblings, you have to imagine. So not, it'd be difficult to be a, a brother or a sister even of Jesus. We'll talk about that in a minute. The date of this is at the Feast of Tabernacles. Why is this important? It'll give us a stamp, a time stamp on where we are in this journey of Jesus. And that's significant for what we're going to learn in a minute. The religious leaders want to kill Jesus. Why? Because in his teaching, his proclamation, he's not just declaring himself as a good teacher. He's not just coming to uh, tell more about religiosity and the rules and the do's and don'ts. He's coming not as a mere mortal, but as Christ, the Messiah. And this is angering the religious leaders who feel like this is heresy. The brothers challenge Jesus to go to Judea. Why? We'll talk about that in a second. Jesus explains the importance of timing. He sends them off. They would have traveled in caravans as a family to these festivals. Jesus later does attend. The people are amazed at his teaching. There's whispering about who he is. And Jesus restates to the crowd, to the brothers, to everyone, that they're missing the point. There's something about his timing that they don't understand. 
So let's talk about these four, four categories. We're gonna move through these pretty quickly. The feast, the cities, the brothers, the timing. What exactly is happening in this story that helps us understand a little bit more about what we can uh, apply to today? First of all, the feast. There were three pilgrimages that took place annually every year, still takes place year for those uh, that are from the Jewish tradition. That was Passover, Pentecost, and the Tabernacle of Feasts. Why is the Tabernacle of Feasts a big deal? Well, first of all, it takes place around October. And we are entering into the last six months of Jesus' life. In fact, this gives us that time stamp knowing that this story takes place around the Feast of Tabernacles. The next feast that will take place, the next pilgrimage, will be Passover when Jesus is hand o- handed over to the authorities and he's crucified and he rises again. That gives us an idea of where we are in the story. But what is the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, it lasted about eight days. Um, And the reason it was called Feast of Tabernacles is because they actually um, constructed these tent-like camping type um, tabernacles. Um, In fact, on the first day, the men would get together and they would gather palm branches and wood and different things to create a tent. Not Not like glamping. Some of you have done the glamorous camping type thing. Not so much that, but these guys would build these, construct construct these these tent-like pieces. They would live in them for seven days. And it was a festival. They would eat and, and tell stories and sing and reflect on the 40 years of wandering that the Israelites did as, as they wandered through with Sinai and with Moses. And during that time period, it was a big deal. And so there was this, this commemorative time of being together in community. And there would have been food and fellowship and all the storytelling, not unlike us going through the holidays right now with some of our own meal experiences, right? Um, Around Thanksgiving and Christmas. Food is a big deal to us, isn't it? It's not just for nourishment physically. It also connects us communally. It connects us as a people as we share stories. Uh, This Christmas uh, Eve services, we were in the back. There's a big whiteboard in the green room and uh, the different worship team members, they they put up there turkey versus ham. And you'd, you'd be surprised how much heated debate all of a sudden emerges as you start talking about what holidays you should have which meat. Um, can you have turkey on Christmas? Can you not have turkey on Thanksgiving? Start that conversation sometime. You'll find out quickly how much tradition plays into what people think you should eat at a certain holiday meal or not eat. We were doing um, some family meals around Thanksgiving and Christmas. We had family over. And as we looked around the table, I was thinking about some of the, the folks that weren't with us this year. Maybe you had that similar experience over a Thanksgiving meal, over a Christmas meal. Normally, at Thanksgiving, Addie's dad would have been with us. He passed away two years ago, just after uh, Thanksgiving. He would have been the one that would have deep fried the two turkeys. Um, He would have been the one who would never have uttered the word Clemson Tigers. Being from South Carolina, the only thing we would have talked about are the South Carolina Gamecocks. And we missed him. Maybe you had some of those folks that weren't around the table with you this year. But maybe there's also some people that we're missing around the table who aren't there because there's been some tension in the family. There's been some arguments, some division, and some relationships have been ripped apart. I looked around at our meals this holidays, and I thought of some people that normally would be there, and they weren't there this year. And I thought about not just the celebration part of those meals, but the the pain that comes sometimes around the holidays when those people aren't there. The Feast of Tabernacles was not meant to be a celebration that just swept everything under the rug and ignored the trauma, the pain, Certainly you can imagine traveling for 40 years in the desert. It wasn't all fun and games. And even in the first century here, as they celebrated and they commemorated, and as they gathered around this feast, they remembered even the pain. Our our vision statement here, engaging people to be fully alive in Jesus, we embrace the fullness of what that means. It doesn't mean we ignore the pain, the hurt, the sorrow, 
It means that we understand as a people, we wanna do even what they did around the Feast of Tabernacles. We remember God's provision, his guidance, his care, the way that he journeys with us. And so if you're in that place today and you're struggling in that way with some people that aren't in your life in the way that you wish that they were, you're in good company here. Let's journey together. Let's finish this year. Let's start next year. And let's see how God invites them back uh, on this journey. I love what uh, this Jewish rabbi from uh, the UK wrote, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, as he describes the Feast of Tabernacles. He says, if I were to summarize the message of the Feast of Tabernacles, I'd say it's a tutorial and how to live with insecurity and still celebrate life. Let's talk about the next piece, the cities. There's two cities that are mentioned here, Galilee and Judea. First of all, Galilee is where Jesus came from. You might remember we just celebrated over Christmas. He was born in Bethlehem. But what happened after that? King Herod, out of fear of his power, um, possibly being taken over by this Messiah, he decreed that all boys under the age of two in Bethlehem were to be uh, killed. And so Mary and Joseph take Jesus. They flee to Egypt. Herod dies, and then they return back to Nazareth. Both Bethlehem and Nazareth took place, it is in Galilee. And so Jesus grew up in Galilee, in this northern part of Palestine. It was rich in a lot of different resources. It was a very vibrant city with uh, agriculture and fishing. And so much took place there. Even the scripture we read in worship, some of those miracles, 25 of the 33 miracles that Jesus performed were done in Galilee. And so Galilee was a big, big deal, it was a big place, but it wasn't as vibrant and as big of a city as Judea. Judea was the capital city. There was kind of a superiority around, uh, around that region. Um, being the capital city with Jerusalem there, uh, there was a lot of activity, a lot of travelers that were coming in. And just like all major cities, especially capital cities, there was just something different that happened there. Even sort of a, a sense of snobbery. I mean, the people from Judea, as they um, looked at those who were from Galilee, even Galileans spoke with a distinctive form of Aramaic that kind of made those in Judea feel like they were better, right? It's kind of like, you know, we sometimes say y'all down here in the South instead of you all. Maybe you had some family members down from the North, the Yankees, um, and they came down and they were giving you a hard time about your accent and you just pushed back and gave it right back to them. That's kind of what's happening here. There was sense, a sense of superiority even in the way that they communicated. And so it's a big deal and what the brothers were trying to do as they were trying to push Jesus to leave Galilee and go prime time, go to the big stage. But some of us here might not have even known that Jesus had siblings. In fact, he had four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. He had at least two sisters, some think as many as three. They're mentioned in different parts of the scripture. And I love what the Holy Spirit included here as, as John wrote this gospel, that this sentence would have been included in this story, that at that time, even Jesus's brothers were not believers. He could have removed that, but he included it, I believe, for those of us who have family members. Maybe you're praying for some people in your life, close friends, close family that are distant from God. I was praying with somebody last night after the service. She was talking about her 20-year-old son that is wandering and lost right now and sure to find himself in some deep, deep trouble. We prayed about that. Maybe you have some of those relationships. I love this reminder in this text that even Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him at the time. They did after the resurrection. It changed everything, but not so much at this time, at this stage. And so his brothers are pushing and pressuring Jesus to expand his popularity. And Jesus pauses and gives them a lesson in timing. Let's talk about this last category timing. I'm reading this book right now that I've really enjoyed over the last few weeks by Daniel H. Pink called When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. You can find all kinds of books out there on the subject of time and timing because there's so much power and control that can be gained if we can manipulate how to get everything to align at just the right moment. Some of us, um, it talks about in the book how, how even biology affects our sense of thinking and emotion and timing. How many of you are morning people here? Raise your hands. Some people, okay. How many are night people? Okay, a little more. The nine o'clock had more morning people. The 11 o'clock 
more night people. I get it. Okay, we're connecting the dots. And then some of you didn't raise your hands at all. The book actually calls you a third bird. Sort of like, yeah, those of you that didn't raise your hand, you're not a night person, not a morning person. There's this other category. All kinds of research has been done on the ways we make decisions. How do we, as morning people, if we have a job that requires us to work at night, how do we make our best decisions at night when we're morning people or vice versa? And it gets into all the science of that. Some of us, though, don't need science. Um, We sort of kind of filter life through Murphy's Laws. Um, I don't know, the last time you read some of Murphy's Laws, I was sharing this with some friends and they're like, I don't know, maybe elementary school is the last time I heard it. Murphy's Laws is sort of viewing timing through a glass half empty type of perspective, right? Sort of an Eeyore perspective on life. Um, one of the, I think it's, it's Murphy's first law. If anything can go wrong, it will. In fact, I had a friend send me a screenshot of, of his phone. He was trying to fly out of Orlando and he said, uh, guess which one is, uh, is my flight? That would be Murphy's Law right there. Everything is on time, on time, boarding, number 44, aircraft, maintenance, forget it, not getting out for hours. That's exactly what Murphy's Law basically tries to communicate. If everything seems to be going well, you've obviously overlooked something. If anything can go wrong on its own, it, um, can't go wrong on its own, someone is sure to make it go wrong. Uh, or this last one, if anything just cannot go wrong, it will anyway. That's sort of the glass half empty perspective on life. And many of us move through uh, our day to day, maybe even 2019 looking back, we could pinpoint many of those days where it just seemed like Murphy's law was in effect over and over and over again. But what about the Old Testament? What do the books of wisdom tell us about timing? I love this text. Many great songs have been written and pulled right from this. Ecclesiastes chapter three, King Solomon, we won't read all of it. He just says this, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn, and a time to dance. What does Jesus teach us about timing? What can we pull from this story in John chapter seven? He uses those words, my time is not yet here for you, any time will do. You might remember earlier in this year, we talked about the different words that are used from the Greek to translate the word time. Chronos is one of those Greek words, chronology, sort of everything that's measured and takes place between sunrise and sunset or sunset to sunrise, how we measure time um, with with watches and, and the chronology of events. What Jesus is using here though is a different word, kairos. It's when you enter into a specific time of day but something different happens. Something transformational takes place. It's when everything comes together in a way that is beyond happenstance or coincidence. Something deeper is taking place. And Jesus is communicating to his brothers, there's a perspective that you have or that you're lacking on time. And it has this kairos effect, this transformation that Jesus is inviting us into that goes far deeper than how we perceive what's happening in the here and now. And so the question is, as we're wrapping up 2019, how do we step into the new year and find these kairos moments? What does it look like? for us to not just go through the motions of everyday life. Maybe you look back on 2019 and you're thinking about all the what ifs, the things that you could have done, should have done, wanted to do, and it just didn't take place. What does it look like in 2020 to start thinking about the transformation that Jesus is inviting us into? These two phrases were taught to me actually by Lori Hall. Um, And I just wanna close with this as a challenge for all of us to think about. Um, Marsh, you you know Marsh Hall, Marshall, as his mother calls him. Um, Marshall is our worship pastor and the whole family moved down here from Chicago. And as they got settled in, they invited us to come over. They were just getting into the house. We sat on the floor, we had pizza and just caught up about life and told stories and just 
kind of hung out. The kids got together, played Legos. Mostly I played Legos. We just had a good time talking, getting to know each other. And in the course of that conversation, like often happens when you're just having a great meal with somebody and, and just talking about things, um, Lori dropped a couple phrases that really stuck in the back of my mind. We didn't have time to go into them. Um, and they were those two phrases, this feels old and naming the new. I went home thinking about it. I woke up the next morning. It's October 28th. I shot her a text and I said, hey, you, you used these two phrases last night over dinner. What, tell me more. What does it mean? So she texted back and said, it'll be easier if I email you. I actually want to read. Lori gave me permission to read part of this email. What does it mean for us when we find ourselves stuck in a deep rut? Maybe we find ourselves struggling with the same habits that are taking us backwards time and time again. Maybe it's a phrase that the enemy uses to get into our heads, to get into our hearts, that makes us feel again that we're insignificant that will never measure up, that our failures are being displayed in front of everyone, and that God must be so disappointed in us. How do, we, how do we change that narrative? How do we identify what is old and step into the new? This is what Lori wrote. Hey, sorry for the delay. I had to talk a kid off of a math ledge. This feels old, and naming the new truly is a practice. (laughs) It's often easier to start when going through a big life transition. It also helps right after a giant fall or disruption takes place, when the dark and the light sit side by side. Have you been in a place like that recently where you can almost touch the darkness and the light? They're battling and you're right in between trying to figure out how to move forward. The more we practice, the more we could identify both old patterns as well as new signs of life. At first we named everything, no matter how big or small, Lori put in quotes, I'm in the room. I'm starting to notice when I'm not in the room, mentally or emotionally. I noticed God revealed a pattern today. I had a hard conversation with a powerful person. It didn't go well, but I showed up. Naming old narratives has also been a big part of the process. You might hear us say, this feels old, and then we figure out together how to change the story and write a new ending. It could be as practical as walking out of the room and then walking back into the room to engage the same conversation again, but in a new way. That's what it means for us when you hear us say, this feels old. We wanna snap out of the dark. Or when you hear us talk about naming the new, to look for a way that God is revealing to us something different. This is hard vulnerable work. It's also trust building and rewarding. Maybe this is more than you wanted to hear, Sean. I hope it's useful. It has been useful. I've thought of those words every day since October 28th. Sometimes just one of them, but often both of them those moments where most of the time I'm going through a situation and the enemy is attacking and he knows just where to attack with the same lies, the same old narrative that's outdated, that has an expiration date that's long past, but I'm still clinging, I'm still hanging on to what the enemy is saying instead of what Jesus is inviting me into and paying attention to the new that he's calling me into. I'm gonna challenge you this morning. I'm gonna ask if you're comfortable, would you close your eyes? If you're comfortable doing that, if not, you can keep a moment open, whatever's less distracting to you. 
But if you'd close your eyes and think for a second, what is a way that the enemy, a specific way, just one way, for a lot of us we have lists, just pick one. What is a line, something that's part of an old story, an old narrative that the enemy just keeps attacking you with again and again and again? And you've got such a tight grip on that instead of opening your hand to the newness of what Christ is offering. Would you think about that? The timing could not be more right. The last couple days of 2019, what is it that we need to let go of so that we can grab onto what Christ has for us in 2020? Would you think about that as we sing this song? Friends, as we are wrapping up this year, let's take away from here what it looks like for us to let Jesus usher in the new and to let go of that old. By the way, I look forward to uh, Lori teaching here some at Northland um, in however way capacity we can make that happen. So much wisdom. Um, you need to get to know her as you've already gotten to know Marsh a little bit. But I also have a family announcement uh, that I wanna share with you. It's gonna seem like a little bit of a hard turn, but I, I actually requested uh, that this announcement be right here at the end of the service. Um, 
It has to do with how we end this year financially. We are just a couple days away from 19 ending, and we have so much to celebrate as we look backwards and think about all the different ministries from children's ministry to youth ministry to local missions, global missions, so much that God is doing. So many resources come out of this church, uh, time, energy, talent, skills, and even finance. And so I want to give you an update on where we are financially. I was actually with, uh, I was at Target on Friday, and I saw Pastor Joel and Becky there. We talked about Baby Yoda a little bit, and, um, and it just reminded me of all the great things that this church has been built on, and the legacy, and also the new of what God is doing in this community, this people who call themselves Northland. And so you can look at the back of your worship guide. This will give you some of the same numbers. But just to give you a refresher, our annualized budget need for this year is $9.5 million. It's a lot of money. Entering December, we were 1.9 uh, in the red. Uh, in order to be fully funded and end the year strong. What's amazing is as of today, and Kirk left, our COO sent me an update on this just from 30 minutes ago, uh, 624,765 is all that we are away from, from being fully funded. Now you might think that's an enormous number, and it is. It's a big number. But it's not a big number to God. And I would love to just challenge you as family, a part of this family, What does it look like for us to prayerfully consider how we can give at the end of this year? I know a lot of of people wait and do uh, year-end gifts. Would you be praying about that uh, over these next couple days? We want to finish the year strong and launch into 2020 uh, ready for all that God is going to do. We're going to send, there will be updates on the Northland app. If you have that on your phone, you can look several times a day. It will be updated and you'll be able to see the progress that we're making over the next uh, 48 hours leading up to January. January 1st. So would you be praying about that? Would you give as you are able and let's celebrate both what God has been doing and let's be excited about what's coming in 2020. Would you stand and let me close us in our time of benediction. In fact, I want to read this scripture from uh, 2 Corinthians uh, as, as our call here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, The new is here. Friends, let us go from here, knowing that the enemy's gonna attack. He knows where the pressure points are. He knows right where our weaknesses are. When those voices begin to come in, change the narrative. Remind yourself, this is old. This is not the story that I know God is writing. And start naming the new. Do that for yourself. Call it out and somebody else this week. Let's go from here, taking the good news of Jesus everywhere we go. Let's do this in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next year.